my god, it just keeps going. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today we're comparing a 2004 Mazda RX-8 Grand Touring versus my 2022 Toyota GR86 base. Now these two cars are more similar than different if you look at the fact that they're both FR, front engine, rear wheel drive. They both make around 230 horsepower and they're both right around 3,000 pounds. This one's actually around 2,800. So this is a car that we're all very familiar with. If you've been watching the channel, you've seen some content, so I'm gonna keep this kind of quick. This is gonna serve as our baseline. You guys know how much I love this vehicle. And the reason I love this vehicle so much is that even regardless of the price, it is so well dialed in. I mean, you go into the interior, you can tell it's a cheaper car, but when it comes to the actual driving inputs, the experience behind the wheel, it is just insane, insane value. The steering rack is definitely a downgrade from the first gen, but it's still good for an EPS unit. It has a strange like on center feedback and kind of stickiness that is a little bit off-putting to me. But the engine is much improved over the first gen. Throttle tip-in is a little bit too aggressive, but I think they did that to make the car feel more peppy than it actually is. The stock suspension is softer and more supple than my first gen 2013 Scion FRS, which is very welcome. That first car was pretty harsh. And because we have this boxer engine with a very low center of gravity, even lower than the Supra, despite what Toyota uh, may say, you know, car and driver did independent testing. It turns out the Supra does have a higher center of gravity by something like an inch or so, a substantial amount. And because the center of gravity is so low, they can actually have it more softly sprung than a comparable sports car and still have great body control. Because when you have a higher center of gravity, you need stiffer suspension to prevent excessive dive and squat and all that, all that body movement, the, the roll and corners and such. This example is, from a driving experience, it's pretty stock. CSG brake pads front and rear, the 21s and 11s respectively. And we got an oil cooler. But the main thing that's influencing the driving behavior right now is actually the wheels and tires. I have Kumho V730s, they have about 10 track days on them, so they're pretty tired, worn out, I need to replace them soon. But 225 section width, all around, square setup. Oh yeah, getting some rotation. And that's really where the magic happens, where you want to... Getting some gravel so it's a little bit looser there. But that's really what you want in an FR sports car. You want to be able to throttle steer, control the direction of the vehicle with not only the steering wheel, but also with the throttle. You can double clutch this without issue. A lot of gravel making this a little bit lower traction than we're used to. But I appreciate that because then we lower the limits and we can explore those limits at a more comfortable speed. And that's part of the beauty of these cars in general is that the reason they came with HP Primacy tires, both first and second gen, remember this is the base, doesn't come with the PS4s, is because with that lower limit, you can really push the car and enjoy it. When the limit's too high, you can't actually push the vehicle in a safe manner on public roads or, you know, sometimes even on track, people with really high-end cars, they can't approach the limit safely and it actually hinders their driving performance. I really love these cars, the, the 8.6, the BRZ. But one of the major drawbacks of this vehicle that started with the first gen and is a little bit improved here, but it's still a problem is actually the engine. It still has that kitchen garbage disposal audio quality to it. It's not the most pleasant sound. It's not the most rewarding to rev out. It doesn't have that nasty torque dip like in the first gen. At least it's far reduced and not really noticeable now. But you don't have that that high screaming red line of the S2000, 9K, or even the 8K AP2. You don't have the smoothness of a rotary engine. We're gonna get to that shortly. But if you're able to overlook the engine, if you're able to overlook the heart of the vehicle, 
which is hard to do because it's such a you know critical part of the vehicle especially nowadays with more and more forced induction and um, you know EVs and such at least the engine is naturally aspirated but when you have a naturally aspirated engine you prefer it to have more endearing qualities than this car. See, the thing with this car is even in third gear, you're able to push it comfortably because it's so gradual with its limits. It's so progressive and just predictable. It's not really a car that bites you. It's a car that, whether you're more advanced or a beginner, you can get a lot of value out of it. Now with that as the baseline, let's hop into the RX-8 and see how it compares. And now it's time for the 2004 RX-8 Grand Touring. Now, get this, the owner Ocean, big thanks to Ocean for letting me drive his car. He got this for 13K off of Brigga Trailer in pristine condition, 20,000 miles. Insane deal, insane deal. He was explaining to me that if you buy on Bring a Trailer a non-special edition car like this, you can actually get a good deal, whereas normally the special edition cars that Bring a Trailer is known for are the ones that demand that really high premium. But with the Grand Touring Package, we have a few nice creature comforts like the sunroof right here, the power seats, and the upgraded Bose Audio, among other things. So, we're powered by a twin rotor, 1.3 liter, Wankel engine, I love saying Wankel, it reminds me of Wanka. And we're pushing out very similar power figure to the GR86, which is 230. We do believe that the GR86 is a little bit underrated, but the torque here is a lot lower. It's around 159 foot-pounds of torque. So this does come with a uh, four-speed auto as well, but that makes less power and it's less reliable as well due to some differences in having reduced cooling on that engine. So this is the one you want, six-speed manual. So first impressions, the seating position is a lot higher in this car than in the GR86. It feels a little bit more, not pedestrian, but maybe more like GT rather than focused sports car. Looks like I only have the option to turn DSC off, which we're gonna do. Oh my God, it just keeps going. <laughs> Such a smooth engine. Silky, buttery smooth. You don't have these crazy, obnoxious vibrations and harshness. Wow. So the car is a little bit larger than the GR86. The chassis, even from this first minute behind the wheel, I can tell it's not as tight, it's not as rigid. It's of course sprung a little bit softer as well. This is more of a, eh, I shouldn't say a proper two plus two, but a more usable two plus two than the, the twins. Now the weight distribution in this car is actually 48 front, 52 rear which is fantastic and it's also, it has a tighter polar moment of inertia because they're able to mount that rotary engine pretty far back. And that's actually what you want when it comes to handling dynamics because if the engine is really far out, look at, you know, Audis, you, you don't get as quick of rotation. So having that tighter polar moment of inertia is really key. And the other thing is you actually want a slight weight distribution towards the rear. They say, oh, 50-50 is perfect. It's actually not. It's symmetric, but it's not perfect. There are benefits to having a slight rear bias to the weight. And we're gonna go over that in a future video, so make sure you're subscribed if you haven't already. Easy to double clutch, downshift. Now this this is an engine really is lacking in torque, whereas that, that second gen GR86 has a lot more power down low. So with this car, it actually reminds me a little bit more of the first gen in that you really, in the mid-range, you're not really getting much, and also at the low end, you really gotta ring it out to get the acceleration you want. 
brake pedal a little bit soft. First inch of travel, kind of vague. <laughs> God, I love naturally aspirated high revving motors. And with the Wankel rotary, just so smooth. Also very progressive and very, very controllable. It's soft enough. It's not twitchy. It's it's more gradual when you start loading up the suspension in either direction. Remember, this does have a lot of shared DNA, shared components with the NC Miata. So you're getting a really nice easy to drive, progressive kind of driving experience. And Mazda is, is very much known for that, even the new gen especially. A lot of body motion. And they do that purposefully because, number one, you can have a more comfortable driving experience day to day, and this is definitely softer than the GR86. But the actual body motion in their mind helps add, add to the drama of the experience. But I'm not sure I agree with that. I generally prefer a car that's a little bit more of a willing dance partner, slightly more taut chassis, because then it's more responsive. This is still a very willing dance partner, don't get me wrong. But you first have to load the suspension and let it set. Whereas there's not as much of a delay in that GR86. As for the steering, it's hard to believe that this is EPS. When I drove uh, a tuned RX-8 in a previous video, I actually thought it was hydraulic. It was so good. Now, that was modified, aftermarket suspension, bushings. Uh, the steering wheel was also aftermarket. So here, the steering isn't quite as good as my experience of that car. But for an early EPS, it's very impressive. You're getting a good amount of texture and feedback. I would say it's actually very comparable to the GR86. It doesn't have that really strange, you know, on center vagueness and stickiness of the GR86. But it is transmitting a bit of data from the front wheel, so I know what's going on. Maybe not quite as much feedback, but at least it doesn't have, again, those issues with the on-center feel as the GR86. I just love how buttery smooth this engine is. My goodness. My goodness. Gives you a little, a very high-pitched, shrill beep as your shift indicator. This car could really use maybe 30 to 50 more horsepower for it to really feel balanced because right now it's nice that the engine encourages you to rev it out because that's that's really where the fun of this vehicle is, of course. That very special Wankel engine, super smooth, you do want to rev it out. But even when you're revving it out, you're not quite getting as much power as you would expect or hope for. Granted, this car is around 200 pounds heavier than the GR86. It makes a lot less torque, similar horsepower, but it's feeling a lot slower. Keep in mind that the GR86 is generally considered to be underrated from factory. Probably making closer to 250 at the crank rather than 230. Now, because of the softer suspension, the front end isn't as pointy as the GR86. Definitely something that you're gonna get used to, but again, the car sets, you know, for a second. Okay, here we go, let's see. Can we overtake a Honda Civic? There we go. <laughs> now, as for the transmission, all the gates are very well delineated. The gates are very well defined. It's pretty notchy, pretty mechanical. I would appreciate it being a little bit more slick and the throws, even though it's a pretty short shifter, pretty pretty long throws, longer than I would have expected. And going from third to fourth, I'm sometimes getting 
caught up on that that portion between second and fourth, getting a little bit of resistance there. See now at 6,000, 6,500, still totally gutless. Downshift to second with a double clutch. The shifter doesn't like being rushed too much. You have to be very intentional with your inputs. But the smoothness of the engine and with that very immediate throttle response makes downshifting quite seamless and natural. You don't really need to think too much about it. It's just more the hand motion here. Now I can feel it's it's very willing to rotate and it's more just that the softer suspension delays the inputs a little bit. It's like you're in slow-mo with the turn in, loads up, settles. But it's definitely willing to rotate. But it's not as easy to do so with the throttle because it is quite underpowered. So it's more based on weight transfer and tossing it around a bit. Yeah, a little bit, I wish the, the, the front end was a little bit sharper and pointier. I mean, you can definitely address it in the aftermarket with some suspension tuning. Sometimes pulling down to the next gate, if you're not exactly super precisely straight, it's going to get caught. The transmission has a very stepwise gear, neutral, next gear, very distinct segmentation to it. But combining this super smooth engine with a double clutch downshift, buttery smooth on buttery smooth. That's what we like. This car reminds me a lot of the first gen FRS in that it's a beautiful canvas on which you can then tune and modify the car to your heart's content where it really matches your intended use case. And while the suspension is soft, it's still a little bit crashy at times. Again, something that I would address with the aftermarket. Obviously, this car is close to two decades older than the GR86 BRZ and you can see that in the chassis tuning, you can see that in the suspension, but it's still a great starting point. And that tuned version that I drove, I was so impressed by the vehicle. The only issue I had with that one was really the power. And considering, considering the price, these cars are such good value. I mean, granted, Ocean got this at a stupid good deal of 13k. I mean, with you know taxes and shipping, maybe it was 14.5. I think after all that, but still a stupid good deal for a car in this condition. I mean, the interior on this car is it dated? Of course. I mean, this is early 2000s, and this particular example has actually held up quite well because the owner took the original owner took great care of it. Only 20,000 miles on it, but you know the seats. They're a little bit soft and not as supportive as I would like compared to the GR86. They are this, um, you know, this interesting striped leather style and this GT trim, which I think is a uh, kind of dates the interior a, a little bit more than I would like. But it is impressive. This has heated seats. My base GR86 does not. You'd have to go premium to get that. Overall, though, a very pleasant car to drive despite its shortcomings. And that engine though, the, the Wankel engine is just such a unique experience. The way it revs, the smoothness, and that's I think one of the main reasons you get this car. You have to of course be okay with the extra maintenance and everything that you know comes with a Wankel rotary. But let's be real, the, the FA24, the GR86, every time I take a right hand turn, my, uh, my sphincter tone increases a little bit, if you know what I mean. But I'm curious to know what you guys think. Between this and the GR86, you know, it's a newer car, a more powerful car, a much more expensive car nowadays, even though on paper they, they do seem quite similar. This versus the first gen FRS or BRZ is actually a more relevant comparison because similar price point, more similar power figures, 
and they're a little bit closer in age as well. My friends, let me know what you think. If you have a car that you want reviewed on Jabal and Cars, visit jabalandcars.com, fill out the form. Much love, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.